Hello again, my course on employment law is finally here. It's basically breaking up an entire textbook's worth of content into easily digestible videos and PowerPoint presentations that you can go through in your own time. And it's hopefully a lot nicer than just having to read the stuff in a boring black and white textbook. But instead of paying textbook prices, you'd basically pay the same for this as you would for a basic revision guide. So if you're interested, then make sure to check it out on the website. Really a must have for anyone who's doing employment law as an undergraduate module on the LLB or a similar related program. Also maybe of interest to people who work in HR or even if you've got a job yourself and you're sort of interested in cluing yourself up about the law in relation to labour. Right, as we did with commercial law, here's a sort of free sample, if you like, uh, and this is my video on the introduction to the contract of employment, because after all, the employment law is really all about the employment contract and how we deal with that contractual situation. So here you go. When we talk about the contract of employment, it's important to remember that we're not just speaking about the piece of paper itself that the contract is written on. We're also talking about the nature of the relationship itself. This is particularly important at the moment when we hear news stories about the gig economy. When we get an Uber somewhere or get a Deliveroo, is that person who drives you or makes the delivery a self-employed person or are they an employee working for a company? The difference is really important and has been litigated on in the courts. We saw this in the 2018 case of Pimlico Plumbers and Smith and that's a case that will be particularly relevant when we're thinking about some of the approaches and tests to defining an employee that we'll look at later on. If you are answering an essay question in this area on the gig economy one of the other documents to look at as well is the Taylor Review from 2017 that looked at trying to make this area of the economy much more fair than it currently is. Well, let's get started with the lecture on the contract of employment and in particular thinking about the people who were involved. Probably the first person to think about when considering the contract of employment is the employer. And this should be relatively easy to define in any problem question because it will be the person who is paying money for the work to be done. The important thing that we can say under section 231 of the Employment Rights Act 1996 or ERA 96 as I'll commonly refer to it as is that this can also refer to a group of employers as well. And these associated employers um, can employ a range of employees but it's important to say that if the employees move from one associated employer to another associated employer, then for the purposes of employment law, their service is considered as being continuing. And this can be especially important when thinking about service time for things like redundancy and also for finding comparators for equal pay. Should say that it doesn't apply for consulting over redundancy, but it's an important factor to bear in mind. Directors of a company are not generally an employee, but sometimes there can be an express or implied service contract, and we'll come back to the idea later of what a service contract is, but essentially it's a contract of employment, and these can apply in relationship to certain directorships, although not especially often. Business consultants are in a similar position. They can be brought in and might be self-employed themselves, on the other hand, they might be salaried employees as part of the company. And as we sort of said in the introduction to this video, it's all about the nature of that relationship between the um, employer and the business consultant. Partners, um, this uh, uh, legislation is normally guaranteed under the Partnership Act 1890. And that act, in the way that it speaks about this business relationship, doesn't really give the impression that partners in a limited partnership or an unlimited partnership are employees. Instead, they are really sort of almost an integral part of the business itself. Now, this did change slightly in the year 2000, where we had the Limited Liability Partnership Act. And this essentially allowed um, think people like dentists or solicitors to set up these LLPs or Limited Liability Partnerships.
and they allowed for the possibility under section 4.4 of a salaried partner or associate. So if you make partner in a law firm, it's not really that you become a partner in the sort of traditional sense under the Partnership Act 1890. It's more that you get a share of the profits of the overall um, company, uh, but you still remain a salaried employee um, with all of the rights associated with that. So that's an important difference. Now, if we move on to sort of thinking about the employment situation more generally, workers is possibly one of the sort of key definitions that we'll be using alongside employee. And before we get stuck into this, it's important to say that we will be creating a distinction between workers on the one hand, which is a relatively broad term, and employees on the other hand, which is more of a narrow term referring to a specific group of people. Workers is just talking about people who work for a living. To get a more precise definition, we can look at section 296 of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992, and this sets out three alternative definitions for a worker. Part A of that definition under section 296 refers to a contract of employment and that itself is a term that's defined in section 224 of the 1992 Act as a contract where a person does work or performs services for another. And we can get a good sense of this and the rights that a worker is entitled to by looking at the 2003 case of Flynn and Tonith Limited, because even though Flynn was a self-employed person, he was still um, under a contract to perform services, and so he was entitled to rights under the National Minimum Wage Act 1998 to a certain amount of holiday time, and so we can see that the workers are still entitled to some rights, even though they don't fall under this narrower interpretation of an employee, uh, that we'll go on to look at in a minute. In the meantime, we can make a final brief point about part-time workers. These are regulated under the 2000 regulations, and the idea behind this is that you can uh, have a comparison with someone who is working full-time and is a full-time worker, and you should not be treated less favourably just because you're working part-time rather than full-time. So employees is probably the key definition and it's the one that you're going to come back to time and time again during uh, your course on employment law. And it's basically an individual who enters into or works under a contract of employment or contract of service or apprenticeship. And that contract can be express or implied. And if it is an express contract, it will either be in writing or oral. So it's a bit more of a precise definition that we have, as I said earlier. Uh, we can get that from Section 23 of the Employment Rights Act 1996, or Section 295 of the 1992 Act. And this idea that an employee is a much more narrower term was expressed in the case of Broadbent and Crisp, by basically saying that while all employees will fall under that wider definition of workers, not all workers will be considered to be employees because it is a narrower definition. Now, how do we actually define this status? You might be a little bit confused at this point, and that would be completely understandable. Essentially, what we're going to try and do now is work out where an employee actually exists and how we can use the nature of the relationship and the nature of the contract to actually define that. So an employee is considered to work under a contract of service. In other words, the employee is working normally for a single employer and providing their service only to them. Whereas a self-employed person works under a contract for services. And you can imagine this because uh, if you were, say, a self-employed cleaner, you might work for sort of five or six different houses and you're providing services for all of them. And we can use a number of tests to try and pin down where an employee actually is. Um, and we'll go through those four tests now and try and come to an idea about which is going to be the best one that you can use if the question of who an employee is comes up in a problem question. So the first test that can be used is called the control test. And very simply, does one person control the actions of another person? Now, in an employment relationship between an employer and an employee, 
there will be much greater control exerted over the employee. And we've seen this in the case of Norwich Party Limited and Payroll Taxation Commissioner. Um, but this idea of the control test has sort of fallen out of use in more recent times because you can imagine situations with more skilled work, say, for example, a computer programmer, where the employer might know absolutely nothing about computer programming. They just know that they want a piece of software to work. And so they don't exert much control over their employee, the programmer. They just um, want something that actually works at the end of the day. So the use of the control test has sort of fallen out, but it's still a useful contribution that we can look to when trying to define who an employee is. Secondly, we can look to the organisational test from Lord Justice Denning. And essentially all that we're asking here is how integral is the employee to the business? In other words, if someone is closely related to the business itself, say, for example, they might have a uniform, a staff card, access to the staff room, different aspects of the relationship that suggest this employee is integral to the business organisation as a whole, then it's more likely that they're going to be considered an employee rather than someone who is a worker or is self-employed. Thirdly, we have the idea of mutuality of obligations, and it's important to explain here what these obligations are. On the one hand, there's an obligation on the employer to actually provide work, and then on the other hand, there's an obligation on the employee to actually do the work. So the case of Bebbington and Palmer that I've put there is quite interesting, well worth a look if you do get a chance. Essentially, it's about a paperboy who claimed unfair dismissal. When after he didn't turn up for a few days to work, he um, got fired. Uh, so his claim for unfair dismissal, the question was, is he really uh, an employee? And the court said, that, well, no, he isn't really, because when he didn't turn up for work, there was no obligation on him to actually do the work if he didn't turn up. And the news agents just simply made alternative um, uh, plans if he didn't turn up for work on a particular day. So he, there wasn't really that mutuality of obligations where the news agents was obliged to provide him with work. So often this is again looking at how things work in practice, looking at the relationship itself as we saw in Prater and Cornwall County Council. The other important thing to consider as part of the mutuality of obligations is that we're referring to a personal service, in other words, something that you have to do yourself if you are an employee. And this means that if you can use a substitute instead of yourself to actually carry out the work, then you won't be considered an employee. And this was quite important in the rather controversial ready mixed concrete case from 1968. And what the concrete firm essentially did here was they sacked all of their drivers and then re-engaged them, but with the idea that they were self-employed because they were given control over their van, um, but they still had to wear things like the uniform and actually maintain the upkeep of the van. Um, but the idea was that if they could use a substitute driver, which they were allowed to do, then for the purpose of the course, then they would be considered self-employed people rather than just employees under another name. Now, that was a little bit controversial because it essentially sounds like the company is getting away with firing all of its employees and getting them on better terms. But um, there are limits to this. And so in the case of McFarlane and Glasgow City Council, again, a substitute could be used, but there were limitations on who could be used as a substitute. The substitute teacher, I think it was in this instance, had to come from a set list of individuals. And so because that choice of a substitute was actually limited, um, the person was still considered to be an employee. So contracts may seek to explicitly exclude the mutuality of obligations. There's a case there from 2005, but you can probably relate this to some of the more recent cases involving Uber, Deliveroo, Pimlico pl plumbers, all of those sorts of things. But again, as we said on the previous slide, what we're looking at here is the nature of the relationship and where that mutuality of obligations actually comes in.
It can also be implied into the contract uh, as well, just as a final point, as we saw in ABC News and Gisbert. So before we finish, the final test that we're going to be looking at is the entrepreneurial test. Hopefully this should be relatively straightforward because all we're asking here is, is could the person be considered to be in business on their own? If they are in business on their own, then they're probably going to be considered to be self-employed um, rather than someone who is actually an employee. And when we're deciding what the answer to that question is, there's a number of factors that we can look at. So what degree of responsibility do they have? Um, if they have a higher degree of responsibility for the work that they do and their actions, probably more likely to be considered self-employed. If there's an opportunity for profit, that's also an, an idea that the person is an entrepreneur or in business on their own. And also, what's the level of skill involved as well? In Airfax Footwear Limited, we were talking about people who were apparently self-employed, but were just working on making heels for trainers. And because of the low level of skill that was involved in that, it was hard to say that the person was actually in business on their own when doing this. And so they were considered to be employees. So out of all of these tests, which is the best one to use? Well, actually, we can take something called a multifactorial approach. And this is what you will be expected to do if this comes up in a problem question. And all that we're doing here is we're taking all four of those tests and trying to apply all of them to the factual situation. So there's no one test that rules them all. It's about trying to get an interpretation of the overall um, practical realities of the employment relationship. So what level of control is there? Is, there? is the person out on business on their own? What are the obligations involved? Are they an integral part of the business? All of these things come together to try and identify whether the individual is an employee or not. So the final thing we can talk about is why is actually this distinction important? Why do we have to distinguish between workers and employees and people who are self-employed? Well, there's a number of important reasons and we'll come on to them in future lectures. But for the time being, we can say that there's important tax reasons. So under the 1992 Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act, um, uh, the employer makes a class one contribution for their employees. Meanwhile, self-employed people play, pay a flat rate class two contribution. And so there is a distinction in the levels of tax that is paid and paid by whom uh, in relation to the work. Liability is also important. Employers will have a vicarious liability for the tortious acts of their employees carried out in the um, course of employment. And so uh, that level of liability simply doesn't exist if the person is self-employed. Health and safety as well. So an employer will owe more health and safety obligations to a person who is their employee rather than someone who is self-employed although there are still obviously health and safety standards that have to be abided by anyway. And finally, we sort of hinted at this earlier, but an employee has much greater rights under the ERA 96, as opposed to people who do still have rights, but have less rights as workers. And so there you have it. The employment contract is as much as anything about the employment relationship. If this area comes up as an essay question, you might want to, as we said at the start, talk about the gig economy and how the different tests can be applied to either confer or take away rights from certain people. If this comes up as a problem question, then the main thing to do is to try and identify the parties who are actually involved in the relationship. Who is the employer and, more importantly, who is the employee? And can they be considered employees once you've applied all four of those tests that we talked about? Well, thanks very much for watching. Come back for part two next and I'll see you soon. Bye.